some of you, because of illness, because of distance, weren't able to be in class when we talked about water in the atmosphere. And so this is a handout that uh, was distributed in class on campus. And yet some of you who were not able to zoom into a class or for one reason or another didn't get this content, you know from the study guide that's already been made available to you that some of this is important for the upcoming assessment. So I think that you can see this handout in front of you, water in the atmosphere. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna make two videos, one for this handout, the second part of the handout that was distributed in class was water leaving the atmosphere and coming back to earth. But I wanna walk you through this just so that you can, can get up to speed so you can feel confident about content that you've missed uh, when you are away from campus. Water in the atmosphere. So where does most of the water in the atmosphere come from? We know that uh, oceans cover a huge uh, percentage of our planet's surface. And so it makes sense that a lot of the water in our atmosphere comes from the oceans and gets into the atmosphere through that slow process known as evaporation. So water in the atmosphere, where does it come from? It comes from the oceans, mostly comes from the oceans, and it gets into the atmosphere through the slow process known as evaporation. Now water can change state as heat is absorbed or released. And you can see that here on the handout. Water changes from one state to another as it absorbs or releases heat. Highlight that, please. You'll need to print out this, this document but highlight this because it's critical that we understand that as water or frankly any other substance is absorbing heat or releasing heat, that it could lead to a change of state. The change from vapor to liquid. So think of water as a gas in the atmosphere uh, and changing to a liquid, that is known as condensation while the change from liquid to vapor, or what could be known as vaporization, is boiling if the water boils, or evaporation if it changes to gas little by little without boiling. So those three blanks in this paragraph should be filled in with the words condensation. That change of state from vapor to liquid is known as condensation, whereas the change from liquid to vapor is boiling if the water boils or evaporation if it changes to gas little by little without boiling. Of course, when liquid water becomes a solid, ice, this is known as freezing, and when the ice becomes liquid again, the process is known as melting. You've known that since you were small children. But the change from the solid state, ice, to the gaseous state is known as sublimation. Sublimation. That's spelled S-U-B-L-I-M-A-T-I-O-N, sublimation. The opposite, when water vapor changes directly into a solid, so from a gas to the solid, that's known as desublimation. And in a little while, we're going, or in the next video that I make, we'll actually talk about what that looks like on Earth's surface. What are those changes of state? What, what are the, the processes that lead to this change of state? And what are the forms that water comes back to earth out of the atmosphere? Let's go to the next paragraph. Actually, let me just repeat that, uh, again, the change from a solid state, ice, to the gaseous state is known as sublimation. The opposite, when water vapor changes directly into a solid, is known as desublimation. I know that you've seen sublimation because you've very likely seen what we call dry ice. That's just frozen carbon dioxide. And you know that even though a block of this dry ice could be sitting there, you can watch it. It looks like fog coming off of it, right? And it is, essentially is. So that's where solid dry ice becomes vapor and uh, that, that vapor or gaseous state that, that move from the solid state to the gaseous state is known as sublimation. Let's go to the next paragraph. Water molecules in whatever state are in constant motion. The speed of their movement depends on the amount of heat that they hold. In class, we actually got a couple of people up next to me and I, I stood and I said, you know, if I were uh, 
a cube of ice, the, the molecules, water molecules in a cube of ice, all I would be doing is vibrating just a little bit. And as heat is added to that ice, those particles, if I'm a water molecule, I would vibrate more, which would cause the people standing next to me, also water molecules, to vibrate a little bit too. And the more vigorously I vibrate, the more I'm going to be bumping into the molecules next to me. And if enough heat is added, then those molecules are going to break free and move fluidly in the liquid phase. They would move fluidly. And even more, uh, as more heat is added, then eventually they would not only move fluidly, they'd start moving extremely energetically and colliding. And that's what gases do. When these molecules collide, some near the surface of ice or water break loose and enter the air. Wind increases the rate of removal by blowing away molecules that have escaped into the air. So the three blanks in that uh, paragraph are water molecules in whatever state are in constant motion. The speed of their movement depends on the amount of heat that they hold. That's a really key idea to hold on to. And finally, in the last one, wind increases the rate of removal by blowing away molecules that have escaped into the air. Let's go to the next paragraph. Temperature affects how much water vapor the atmosphere can hold. At higher temperatures, the atmosphere can hold more water vapor. In the south where we live, we know that in the summer the air is warm and it's also muggy. Warm air can hold more water vapor. The temperature at which the relative humidity is 100% is known as the dew point, dew, D-E-W, the dew point. When air cools, it cannot hold as much water vapor, so some of it will condense or possibly um, desublimate. The resulting liquid or solid water exists in the air as fog or mist. We see that a lot in the Tennessee River Valley. We see quite a lot of fog, water vapor in the air hanging close to the ground. Again, that's happening because of the difference in the temperature of the air and Earth's surface. The next paragraph. A cloud is a mass of water droplets or ice crystals suspended in the air. Clouds form when the temperature of a mass of warm, humid air decreases. Again, that's the process of condensation occurring. So it could be a, a, the situation of desublimation if we're talking about clouds made up of ice crystals. But clouds that are made up of small droplets of water, they're forming through the process of condensation. If we're talking about clouds that are made up of ice crystals, that would probably more likely be the process of desublimation. Let's go to the next paragraph. A warm, as warm, humid air rises, its temperature eventually decreases or cools below the dew point. When the water vapor must condense, then the water vapor must condense, but to condense at the dew point, condensation nuclei are needed. In other words, for something to condense, for, to condense, for water to condense, you need condensation nuclei. And those are just, to answer the question at the bottom of the page, what are these? They're just little bits of dust, particles of clay, tiny, tiny specks of something, could even be small pollen grains, that provide a, a place for condensation to begin. Let's go to the, the second page of the packet. You can see that on the screen in front of you. If the dew point is below freezing, the vapor in the humid air cools directly into ice crystals without becoming liquid first. That happens, we uh, call that process, of course, desublimation. Uh, for this freezing to occur, freezing nuclei, particles of clay or dust must be present. So whether we're talking about condensation or desublimation, we need little particles uh, that, that provide a nucleation point uh, for either condensation to occur or desublimation to occur. The next paragraph goes on. It's talking about uh, conditions in the atmosphere can be 
unusual that you can have water that's actually much colder than freezing. So it says here, on some occasions, clouds of liquid water exist in the troposphere at temperatures far below the freezing point of water, even as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius slash Fahrenheit. The reason it says Celsius slash Fahrenheit is the two scales, Fahrenheit and Celsius, actually meet at minus 40 degrees. So minus 40 degrees C equals minus 40 degrees F. That's just the point at which the two scales intersect. This water, to fill in the blank here, this water is known as supercooled water, supercooled water, and constitutes a significant problem because it freezes on the wings of aircraft that fly through it. This freezing is known as icing, I-C-I-N-G. Not to be confused with icing like on a cake or a cookie, this is ice actually take building up on the wings of commercial aircraft or sometimes military aircraft. And it's a significant problem because that extra weight is not a good situation for, for aircraft. It can lead actually to the crash of those aircrafts and then that's not safe for the pilot or for their, his passengers or her passengers. Let's go on down to this next part about clouds. The movement of air determines the shape of clouds. Horizontal movement causes the formation of layers. That makes sense, right? If, if wind is moving horizontally, more or less parallel to Earth's surface, then the clouds are likely going to, to be kind of flat, stretched out layers. Whereas vertical movement forms clumps or billows the big white puffy clouds that we tend to have in the summer in Huntsville. Clouds are named according to their shapes and altitudes. And we're gonna see that in this next little section. Highlight that, you can see it's in italics. I'd like you to know that clouds are named according to their shapes and altitudes. So there are three basic shapes of clouds. The flat layers or sheets are known as stratus clouds, S-T-R, a-T-U-S, stratus clouds. And you see these often in at least the American South. We see these clouds often at sunrise and at sunset. Flat layers or sheets are known as stratus clouds. The second shape, the piles, the big puffy piles, the big billowy clouds, those are known as cumulus clouds, C-U-M-U-L. U-S, cumulus, C-U-M-U-L-U-S. The big white puffy clouds that look like a lot of cotton balls. Those are cumulus clouds. The wispy curls, sometimes known as mare's tails. Think of female horse, mare's tails. Those are known as cirrus clouds, C-I-R-R-U-S. So the three blanks there are stratus clouds. Those are the flat layers or sheets. The piles, the billowy clouds are known as cumulus clouds. The wispy curls are known as cirrus clouds. So look at these last two parts of the page. Clouds that bring rain tend to be dark or gray and are called nimbus clouds. N-I-M-B-U-S, nimbus clouds. Most of the time, the, the rain clouds that we see, at least in Northern Alabama, are cumulonimbus clouds. They're cumulus clouds, puffy clouds, but they're gray, so they're nimbus. That's because they're full of water and ready to bring rain or other precipitation. Then there are altitude terms that are used to describe clouds. Um, if they're low clouds, they're strato, medium clouds, alto, high clouds, zero. And then, of course, there's what we call vertical development. These are the clouds that lead to a lot of thunderstorms and particularly hail, we talked previously about frozen precipitation. And so these terms, these uh, prefixes are added to cloud shapes to indicate the altitude of those clouds. Okay, I will uh, cease this and switch to the other handout, which is water leaving the atmosphere and coming back to earth. If you have questions, please uh, contact me and uh, feel free to, to listen to this video and to use it as many times as necessary to become comfortable with the content about water in the atmosphere.
Thanks. Bye for now.